from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is now my pleasure to introduce Aliasha Shabazz, the third daughter of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz. Aliasha, which means God is present, is a community, or community organizer, activist, humanitarian, and motiv motivational speaker. She is the author of Growing Up X, The Diary of Malcolm X, and The Boy Who Grew Up to Become Malcolm X. Ms. Shabazz promotes higher education, interfaith dialogue, and building bridges for young leaders around the world. She is the driving force behind the Wake Up Tour, an exclusive youth empowerment program. She is the founder of Malcolm X Enterprises and is a trustee for the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center. Without further ado, we would like to welcome Ilyasha Shabazz. And now, we'll play the video. A young Beautiful, beautiful, my God. Beautiful, 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 beautiful,
his mother and his dad. And so Malcolm Little is written, you see the cover of this book, it's a young impressionable child and it says that all of us start off as children and whomever we are today, it's because of what the adults around us taught us. And so it's our responsibility as all the big beautiful adults, it looks like most of you in here are about 15 or 16 years old, and um, it's our responsibility as the bigger adults to make sure that we're teaching our children very well so that they can go off to be great and do wonderful things like Malcolm X did. Um, my favorite people in the world are the children. I have one uh, uh, excerpt that I'd like to read about the garden and how Malcolm came to uh, be all that he could. And, and, and so we have a picture here of Malcolm, young Malcolm in the garden with his mom. And I have to say that his dad was the president of the Marcus Garvey movement in the 1920s. His mother was the, re the uh, national recording secretary and she was the one who instilled the desire, the passion for learning, the passion for education. And just as Malcolm found inspiration from his father's speeches at church, he learned some unexpected lessons from his mother's garden at home. For Malcolm, the enchanted garden of Louise Norton Little was an entire world of its own, where even the most sluggish of ladybugs and the fastest scurrying ants were all equally treated like esteemed and welcome guests at a family Sunday brunch. Here, savvy spiders busily crocheted their delicate webs along the foliage, allowing the strong Midwestern sunshine to cast pretty patterned shadows on the, on the soft earth below. Geraniums dotted the field in the distance with peppy pops of pink and purple as the crisp blue sky and lush green field connected somewhere far out in the horizon. In the sacred garden, beetles hustled about like harried businessmen on their way to important meetings while snails lolled leisurely as if they were on some kind of half-speed permanent vacation. Here, Louise taught her children to love every living creature, equally large or small, pretty or not so pretty, busy or still, fast or slow, insect or plant. The garden was a testament to the true and unconditional brotherhood from the earth on up to the sky, a daily lesson in acceptance and equality. Each living creature had a story, a purpose, a reason for being, and a beauty of its own. Through the majestic trees in the garden, Malcolm would also learn about the importance of roots, nature's anchors, the base of every living creature, and through the outspread wings of the chirping birds above, he began to see the power of possibility. And so, we just want to make sure that all of our children understand if you persevere, if you have that courage, you keep trying, that you can go out and do these great, great things that all of the adults around you do. And so we understand the foundation that was provided by Malcolm from his mother and his father and the fun that he had with his children, I mean with his brothers and sisters, his siblings, that he was able to go out and become this great international political strategist, okay? So I wanna make sure that I do have some time for some questions. Um, we have 10 minutes for questions. And there are two mics in the center of the aisle. If if you would like to come up and ask any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. How many of you heard of Malcolm X? Very good. Yes, what's your question? How are we gonna, what's your question? Is there a microphone for him? He has it right here. Okay, there's a young boy right here who wanted to ask a question. Okay, let's see. Um, how many books have you written? 
Okay, my first book was Growing Up X, and that's a, a coming of age memoir that I wrote after my mother passed away. Before my mother passed away, I um, was a little introverted. You know, I, I didn't go out into the public a lot, you know, to do public speaking. But after my mother passed away, I wanted to make sure that I shared the story of Malcolm and Betty to inspire other children and young people. So I wrote that book in, 19, in uh, 2002. My second book is Growing Up X, which, well, actually, that is my, my second book is Malcolm Little, uh, which is the children's illustration book, which just came out in January. And in January um, of 2015, I have uh, another book that's coming on Candlewick Press, which is simply entitled X, and that's a young adult version of Malcolm. Okay, and I have more or less a follow-up question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> What's your favorite book that you've written? Say that again? What's your favorite book that you've written? My favorite book is Malcolm Little because my favorite people are the children. You know, and I want you all to understand that the roles you will play, that one day you are going to be the adults that you look up to. And so you have to make sure that you learn every single thing that you possibly can so when the other children start asking you questions, you have the best answers for them. And that you can make sure that everyone is treated fairly and equally and that they know that they are worthy of self-love. And that is the most important thing. Yes, young man, right here. Yes. You studied Malcolm X? Very good, very good. Um, yes, young lady, right here. Very good. What inspired me to write? You all. I love children. I love children. And I wanted to make sure that you could look in a book and that you can see people who look like you and you could feel good about these people and you would know your role as young children, your role to give back your role to be kind, your role to learn as much as you possibly can. Yes. Why did I start writing books? Oh, when? I started writing, well, actually, I, I wrote books when I was as young as you. I used to write stories when I was a little girl as a hobby. And I just had a, a, a passion and joy and fun writing stories and creating stories and drawing pictures and doing all of those great things. But I went to school and I was a biology major. <laughs> and then I went and got a master's in education. <laughs> so you see the connection. My first book was Growing Up X, and I wrote that in 2002. Yes? Um, what are all your books about? Oh, very good question. Uh, my books are about all of the things that little boys and little girls like. They're about equality. It's about respecting the earth, respecting the grass and the trees, making sure you don't pollute. Um, it's about investing in yourself and knowing that you're worthy of a quality education, the best education that you can have. Um, it's about all the things that make you feel good about yourself so that you know that you are worthy of self-love. You know, it's about all of those great things that empower and motivate us to do better and to feel good about ourselves. So if we feel good about ourselves, then we're going to treat our neighbors, all the other little boys and girls well, right? Then there's no time for any nonsense. Yes. <laughs> How much works did you read? How many words can I read? How many, How many books, books did I write? Three. Oh my goodness, I, I read so many books. And the more books you read, the bigger you get, the happier you get. You get to eat more food. You get to do all the things that you love the most. You just have to read as many books that you possibly can, and even you will become very, very smart like your parents. 
<laughs> yes. I love insects. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is my first oh, time. Oh, we still have time. Should I read one more section? OK, just one more quick section. Yes, young lady. Oh, gosh, have I ever touched a slug? You mean those little slimy things that are gooey and sticky? You did? Did you like the feeling of it? Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Here's another section about Malcolm going fishing. On sunny afternoons after school, when the air was still warm from the day and the chores were done, Malcolm loved to go fishing with his friend Big Boy. The two of them would stand over the stream like a pair of kings surveying their empire. They stood quietly, eagerly, waiting for their fishing lines to move for even just a hint of a ripple in the stillness of that glistening water. Sometimes they'd stand there for hours watching the stream as if nothing else mattered. They would scratch their heads and exchange looks that said, what could we possibly be doing wrong? Malcolm and Big Boy knew that if they wanted results, they were gonna have to come up with a clever way of catching the fish. What were they not thinking of? Malcolm would scratch his head, squinting through the sunshine, and mull it over with Big Boy, both of them trying to come up with a better way to attract the fish. Then one day on the bridge, while the lines were still, Malcolm felt a rumble in his belly. The thought of the delicious supper that was waiting for him at home crept into his mind. Freshly baked buttery biscuits, herb roasted chicken, vegetables from the garden, and a homemade apple pie with ice cream, caramel, chocolate, and strawberries. Malcolm imagined the aromas that would fill the little house at dusk, and then suddenly it hit him. They needed better bait. Just like the aromas of dinner brought him and his siblings running to the table, Malcolm and Big Boy needed to lure the fish to come swimming to their lines. Their plastic earthworms obviously weren't cutting it. The next day, just before Malcolm cast his fishing rod into the stream, he pulled a handful of, bre of breadcrumbs from his pocket and hurled them into the water, where they landed like pretty drops of cotton candy. Soon, tiny bubbles appeared around the crumbs, and just like the children would come running to the table each night, the fish swam around to see what treasures Malcolm and Big Boy had to offer. From that day on, the boys caught big, beautiful fish. But most importantly, Malcolm learned that observation and effort could combine to create desired results. And so it says that you must persevere, that whatever it is you want in life, you have to have the dream and the vision, and you have to persevere and keep trying and trying until you do it better and better and better. And we know that you guys are the best. We know that you guys rock. We know that you guys rule and that you are going to be the best leaders for this country. Yes! <laughs> now I just have four more minutes. Is there another question? Yes, young man. And I will be signing the books downstairs at uh, 4.30, right? 4.30. Upstairs. On the second floor upstairs from 4.30 to 5.30 for one full hour. And I have to tell you that it is a very beautiful book. You know, a lot of people didn't understand what it, the values and the foundation that my father had from his parents, the role of his mother, the role of his father that would allow him to go on later in life as a young man, only in his 20s when the world learned of Malcolm X and killed at 39. But in the 12 short years in the 1960s, during the social climate that he was able to make such a, a, an impact and travel the globe in search of solutions to what would oppress you know, people. And so he was seeking 
uh, solutions to the human condition that would do these kinds of things. And so being just a young man and making such a significant contribution, I think it's extremely important to see the foundation that was provided that would enable someone to go and sacrifice his life for us so, you know, to lead us into a more egalitarian future and not ask for anything in return, not a penny in return for himself or his family, but serving God and serving humanity. And I hope that each one of us will understand that and we will make sure that we invest in our children and we teach them the truth of self-love. It doesn't matter if you're from, wh wherever you're from, whether you're from, wherever you're from, it doesn't matter where you're from, but just understand that we're all brothers and sisters. You know, my, my mother raised us understanding that uh, we are simply brothers and sisters under the family and fatherhood of God. And that's how we were raised, that it was more importantly to know one's values than to know, the, the, you know what, what makes us different. That we could learn and embrace uh, so much from just coming together and listening to one another. And I hope as the educated adults, all of you all who look like you're a little over 16 years old, that we will make sure that we teach our children and we really invest in them and that we're honest and that, you know, we instill these great values in our children. And it, oh wait, is that 3.50 now? Okay, five minutes? Okay, yes, young man. Yes, I was two years old when my father was killed. And, you know, I have to say that a week prior, my mother, um, you know, our home, there was a little firebomb. And, you know, you look at this woman, his wife, who was in her 20s, and she had four babies, and she, had, she was pregnant with twins. How was she able to go on? How was she able, you know, to accomplish all that she did? She went, she got her master's, she got her PhD. She, you know, raised six girls as the wife of a man who challenged um, some unjust situations, and she just soared. And I often ask myself, how was she able to do that? I ask my mother, how were you able to do that? She loved her husband. Uh, she loved and respected her husband, and um, she never accepted no or I can't as an answer. She did not live her life as a victim, um, and so she did some really, really remarkable things. Yes, you beautiful young girl with the pretty pink Yes, it's you with the pretty pink and the, yes. <laughs> I wrote three books, three books, and I know you're gonna write one too, yes. How come I read so many words? How, many, how come I read so many books? Because I, if you read a lot of books, you become smart and you're able to answer when people ask you questions. Sometimes it's good to be able to help them and give them answers or give them your insight. And you get that insight from reading books. Yes. My father was, um, he was killed. Yes. My best memory of my father, my father was like six foot four, a little over six foot four. You know, a lot of people, when, you know, when I go to these wax museums, I see this little man and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, nothing against short men, of course. But, um, you know, when someone is six foot four and six foot five, you know, you want to just like really get the, the, the clear perception of who, you know, this, you know, how did he make this great impact and, and what did he look like? And, you know, I'm such a visionary. My father was six foot, a little over six foot four and, um, so I just remember looking up at my father, just flickering images I talk about in my book. I remember his big pearly white teeth. He was always smiling. You know, he was just so kind and gentle. And I remember he would call my name Il Yasa, you know? And so my mother said when I was a little girl, you know, people, Il Yasa, Il Yasa. And you know, I just keep going and you know, I didn't pay attention to anyone. But when I heard my father's voice, Il Yasa, that I just stopped you know, and I'd freeze and I'd give my attention to my father. So those great memories, beautiful doll that I, that I had, beautiful brown doll with this long hair. I remember that beautiful doll. I remember my beautiful blue and white rocking chair. I remember my puppets. I remember just so many, something about the, 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 the um, oh gosh, I can't think right now, but just so many different uh, exciting times. So I thank you very much for coming and I hope that I see you down upstairs. I hope I see you upstairs, upstairs.
at 4.30. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.